Welcome to episode 10 of Film Tracks. Today, Jesse and I have a very special guest. Daniel Licht is on the show. He's an award-winning composer who did recently Silent Hill Downpour, and he's notoriously known for all of his awesome score cues in the series Dexter. But he also is here to make a very important announcement, so don't go anywhere. We have a very great show for you. Hosting and bandwidth for Trigla is provided by Media Temple. You know anybody that wants to sponsor us? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to episode 10 of Film Tracks. Jesse and I are here to talk about what we love the most, soundtracks. And um, if this is your first time joining us, we definitely try to get the show to talk about sound and image and why it's important in film and television. So today, I'd like to welcome our awesome guest, Daniel Licht. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> so Daniel, I think to start off, before we start getting into any conversation, we should show someone, a, show our audience a very quick video clip of what exactly your music entails. So let's, let's check this out. My name is Daniel Licht and I'm the composer for Dexter. And this season, for the fifth season, I decided to use some new sounds and so I collected a bunch of scalpels and surgical instruments and chemistry bottles to uh, make a, a new sound for the show for Dexter. I decided I wanted to uh, see what it'd be like to bow surgical instruments. I had this idea that it would, if I took a bow along the sharp edge of a scalpel, that it would make this kind of singing, kind of screaming sound. I built this little resonating chamber for uh, attaching the surgical instruments to, and then I play it with a bow like this, and it has a pretty gruesome kind of sound. I also use it, use it for bass notes sometimes. I had to use the sound of duct tape. Just did it. It kind of has a nice violent kind of sound to it. I chose to use this pail, this autopsy pail, instead of a regular drum on the chase scene because I thought it had like a really unique sound to it. It's uh, more of a metallic sound. It's almost like a cross between a, a bell and a drum. So I thought it'd be really interesting to use uh, the sound of scissors. This is a, a household scissors, the little one. I like to use this for the faster parts. And this is a surgical scissors. I use this for, uh, for the more accented parts. What I like about scissors is there's an action reaction to the sound. You hear a click and then a... These are impactors. I don't know what they're used for in surgery, but I just like the way they sounded. In previous seasons, I used uh, human bones to make music with, but I couldn't get any this year, so I had to settle with cow bones, but they still make a good sound. This is a musical saw. I use it for, uh, for Dexter's theme sometimes. It's very hard to play in tune. Probably makes the string players 
teeth grind a little bit when they hear this. I've had a really great time making music for this season of Dexter, and I've gotten into some really interesting things and had some fun with bone saws and surgical instruments. Well, I hope you get a chance to watch the show, and maybe you'll uh, get a chance to hear some interesting sounds behind the scenes. The end. So that kind of sums up your music in a sense. It seems like it's very multi-layered you have a lot of elements that go into a theme. So talk about, like, I'm curious as to, like, what, how you begin this process. Like, do you have a bunch of loops that you have to go out and record, or do you kind of just have a library that you pick and choose from? Um, what's your starting point for something like this? Well, I, I do want to start by saying, as a disclaimer, that no one should try this at home. <laughs> <laughs> the bowing of the scalpels and the song of bones. Yeah, where did you get all this stuff, first of all? <laughs> I actually got it. I bought some of it, but I, I got some of it from a medical prop house. Oh, that's um, cool. That's cool. But, um, yeah, did you tell them you were a composer, that you needed it for musical purposes? I did, actually. <laughs> and were they like, <laughs> very cool? They're like, yeah, great, why not? Were they you still charged me a lot of money for it, though. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> but, I mean, obviously, it's, it's a great idea. It's really cool, and it works really well. Were you ever, like, unsure, like, when you're sitting there and, like, you're, like doing the scissors in front of the microphone? Were you ever like worried like this is gonna sound like crap like at one point? Or like how did you know that it would all come together like that? Well, you know, if it sounds like crap, I don't use it. There you go. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> you know, it's But it's like, it seems so, like when you hear a theme, let's say you see a scene on, on a screen, right? Mm -hmm. And it's an action sequence or it's like a scary moment or something. As a musician, do you hear what you need to record? Like do you're like, oh, I need to, figure out a way to get this sound, and then you go out and search for these things? Is that how you work? Well, well, generally, um, you want to, when you first get on a project, you want to figure out, it's like a nut. It's like a really hard walnut. And you want to figure out, how am I going to crack it? You turn it this way, you turn it this way, you hit it with a hammer. You know. Sometimes you have to go out and get the hammer. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really, you know, you're looking at the, you're looking at the plot, you're looking at the character, you're looking at, am I, you know, am I writing music from the specific point of view of one person? Am I commenting on a bunch of people who are interacting, so the music is sort of coming from the screenwriter or the director, really, or mm -hmm. from God, whatever, however you look at it, mm -hmm. sort of outside. Mm -hmm. So I, you really, what you do is you pull apart the drama and figure out, okay, what, does, what is the music going to contribute to the drama? Like I'll give you for instance, for with Dexter, you know, I knew that he he was the main character, and we the, the show is about us empathizing and getting inside his head. Mm -hmm. So what I decided to do is a, is use a combination of these kind of primal drums because that's sort of his his urge, you know, his you know his killing, need yeah. his, his need, need to, to kill. Mm. Yeah, it's like an in, his in, thirst, I guess. His thirst for blood. It's an instinct gone or awry or something. <laughs> but then I, I combine that with kind of soft, sensitive instruments, which are pianos and harps, and that sort of gives his sensitivity into it. And voices, female voices, kind of distant, haunting, echoing. So it's sort of. Uh, so that it was the drama that inspired the instru instrumentation. I need to figure out. I mean, you, it used to be that when people scored, they would just write for an orchestra. Mm -hmm. And they might pick a soloist. But now, you really want to pick your sounds. You want to, you, like, I'll, like before I start on a project, I will spend, either I'll work out my instrument list or I'll do some sound design. I come up with my sounds and then my, I pull my themes out of that. Or sometimes I'll write a theme and then I'll figure out what's the best instrument to play that theme. But these are the these are the tinker toys. These are the building blocks. Oh. And I like to have them all lined up if I can before I start. 
So did you, <coughs> when you first started, when you first started composing, um, did you kind of go from these recorded sounds like you're talking about? And I mean, is this something that you did when you were really young? Like you started recording sounds and making music out of it that way? Or did you start from like a very orchestral based, well, you that, know, uh, scoring technique and then kind of go more into this very interesting, um, you know, multi level score, you know, soundscape? Well, I, I, um, I had a very eclectic musical background. I mean, I, I studied composition and I, I played jazz, I learned jazz, and I also got interested in world music when I was in college. Hmm. Um, and I got involved in kind of New York City, Lower East Side avant-garde performances. And I would do stuff like I would have electric guitars and I'd put frying pans on them and let them go, <laughs> you know, make sounds, <laughs> you know. So I was, I was studying world music. I actually went to Indonesia and studied. I was very serious about playing gamelan music gamelan, for a while. Yeah. Wow. So it's a cool instrument. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't really until I got, and I played jazz and, I, you know, I played with Don Cherry. I mean, I had a whole, you know, New York experience. Um, it, was, it wasn't until I got into film scoring that I finally figured out, wow. I can, this is some place I can use because I was like, you know, here's this Western guy trying to play gamelan music. I'm just <laughs> never going to be it. Yeah. Like, it's just hopeless. Not a lot of money know? in that. <laughs> you know? Not a lot of money, and it's like, I'm just never going to be as good as people who grew up in that exactly. country and tradition. Um, but I love doing it. So for me, it was, I mean, the gamelan music kind of is ostinato based. So it was very actually applicable. It's a different musical system. We can get into that more. Mm -hmm later but it's actually very applicable to film scoring because it's you know it's, it's sort of like tension you know it's something moving constantly um so it was film scoring that that you know made gave me the freedom to put it all together you know so did you see a movie and then say as a musician did you say i've got a did you start experimenting with images um on you know did you start playing music while you saw certain things and then recording it or did you just make the jump and say I'm going to be a film score composer. And well, the first film I scored actually was in college, and I had no idea what I was doing. I wasn't taking a course in it, and uh, a friend of mine was directing it, and he had no idea what he was doing either. Yeah, as he, most college students don't really yeah. know, <laughs> know what they're doing. He, he decided <laughs> to shoot a feature film, um, and, but he shot it reel by reel, because there was, there was a, an actor, he was a Puerto Rican soap opera star who lived up there. Um, who basically mortgaged his house to make this film. And, and my friend Matthew Patrick directed it. It's called Atrapados. It's in Spanish. Do you have Spanish. a copy of it? Oh, I, I could get one. It would be funny, <laughs> fun to watch. Yeah, but um, I had no idea what I was doing. And That's the key, though, like when you start, is like you have to like start somewhere, and like if you, you, know, you just find someone at the same level as you're at, and you just kind of learn together. Like yeah, find the yeah. young filmmakers. If people listening want to get into music supervision or composing, find someone else at your level and just figure it out along the way, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a good thing to do. Um, as it turned out, that was just something I did. I didn't really pursue film scoring after that. I went to New York and was playing jazz and gamelan music and downtown art music. and I just got into scoring commercials just to make some money. and That's when I got into scoring. And it wasn't actually, it was Chris Young, who was a friend of mine, who... So funny. <laughs> Chris Young again. Chris Young again. <laughs> he always comes up in our <laughs> conversations here. <laughs> it was actually him that, that, that got, the, got me into the film scoring bug. I came out to visit him, and he had, was doing recording, and he had like a Japanese percussion ensemble and a little string section and some vocalists. And I'm like, okay, I like this. I this is, that. This is, it kind of, kind of, some, something clicked in my head. It's like, wow, this is where I can put it all together. And I actually became more of a fan. I mean, Chris, you know, really, you know, said, oh, you gotta listen to, that's how Chris talks. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta listen to Jerry Goldsmith. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so, uh, you know, Chris gave me some really good advice about learning, learning film music, and that, that is really important. And a lot of, I've had people come to me and say, oh, I wanna film, I wanna score films. And I said, well, have you listened to this person? Have you listened to this person? Like, oh, no, 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 I want to do something original. I don't listen to them. I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, you How are you going to know if it's original if you haven't listened to them? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So it is, in, it is important. Obviously, I mean, you know, throughout the history of art, 
artists have always imitated people. I mean, forever. It'll yeah. Yeah. And it's and it's like, you know, it's like Charlie Parker used to say. It's like you go and practice, 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 and then just forget. Yeah. What you practice. Just well, play. Do you find that a lot of your jazz influences? I mean, it obviously must influence a lot of the way that you approach scoring something. A little bit, but jazz is is pr is probably the most useless knowledge that I have in terms really? of film scoring. <laughs> okay. Once you're doing a specific jazz thing, it's just never comes up. It's too much improvisation and whatnot. It's just it's, it's just very specific. I mean, you know, I just whenever I've written jazz, it would, unless it's specific to a scene, the director will go, "Oh my God, it's too sad. Oh, it's too intellectual." <laughs> Too intellectual, go, really. Like that. Go, oh, that's not funny at all. Jazz is not funny. Can, you, can we have some Latin music? You know, that's funny. <laughs> I'm just saying that's just the way it is. It's like, you know, you have Twin Peaks. You have, you know, jazz has been used. And um, well, um, were you gonna say something, Jeff? No, I I agree. Like it's definitely underused. I don't. I'm trying to like think of like some good jazz scores or even just jazz well, cues. I, and it's it's hard unless you have a score by like Wynton Marsalis or something. But it's always like jazz is always infused with some sort of like thematic mm -hmm. something. I mean, you might have like a like a horn or something like that or a trumpet playing jazz, but there's right. always like an undertone of score mm -hmm. or something that's more cinem quote unquote cinematic. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I mean, unless it's the, the subject is about jazz. Yeah. I mean, obviously there's some great jazz scores like. Um, Duke Ellington did Touch some of stuff. Evil, I think. Is it? I think Miles yeah. Davis even did yeah, some Miles, jazz stuff. Miles did Escalator Under the Stairs. He did. He scored that. Yeah. I think he improvised it though. I don't think he actually scored it. Yes, he didn't. He just he came just, in and he showed up. He showed up and they recorded <laughs> it. Yeah, they, they showed the film and he his, he played with it. It's probably yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's like, yeah it is yeah. great. It is really good. Um, well, you know, I think to demonstrate for our viewers um, who may not know your work, I mm -hmm. think there's there's a cue that I have that kind of demonstrates your shift from. Um, kind of an eclectic, eclectic theme to something that's very open and, um, and airy and more ambient. And I think that this kind of like, at least when I was listening to the Dexter scores, is kind of like a running game with every cue. There's always something that, that starts very thematically and then may shift immediately into something that has a piano. Or it might start with a percussion that's loud, but then there's something that goes into some very emotional kind of side. And I was like, man, I've only seen the first season of Dexter, but it really does pinpoint his like eclectic nature, like as a killer, but there's also this like like you said you have to empathize with him a little bit and see him as a human being. I mean, he is a good a good guy at mm -hmm. the end of the day. He's a decent guy and he does oddly enough do good for people <laughs> like killing mm -hmm. people that suck. <laughs> um, so I think it's a very interesting show, but I think that that after thinking that way um, the, the cues are even more interesting to listen to on their own. So let's check out this this cue called The Mother of All Cannibals. In about um, a minute or so, listen to how the theme actually changes completely into some very soft ambient textures. So let's check it out.
So you were saying actually that that's the least jazzy cue ever that I picked, right? No, well, that's no, the, the most. most. The most jazzy. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that's that's actually one of the rare <laughs> jazz. Rare cues occasion that, I, that it actually is jazzy. Yeah. But um, but like I said before, it's like it shifts completely in kind of like you're listening to it and it's this percussion sound and then all of a sudden it changes into this very kind of like open emotional theme. Right, right. And um, is that something that you're going based on what you're looking at? Like are you looking at a scene and that's what you're composing over or is it kind of changes based on what you're looking at on the show, right? Um, sure, absolutely. I mean, television is, I mean, Dexter in particular has longer forms, but television in general is going to be much shorter uh, compositions than in film. You know, you're gonna, your in terms of time? In terms of time, your longest cue is going to be two minutes. And so you're going to, and a lot of cues are going to change. You know, things happen Quickly, faster yeah. in TV. Mm -hmm. The arcs have to be a lot quicker. Um, but, you know, what you want to do, and then, and then in, in television you're dealing with um, different storylines. You know, with generally film, you know, you might have a B story, but it always relates in particular to the main story. Um, just as an aside, I actually have studied some screenwriting, and I, I recommend for anybody who wants everybody who wants to be a film composer is to read some screenwriting books hmm. because you you want to learn the language. So most uh, producers of televisions are writers, and most directors have written as well. And if they right. haven't written, they have to know how to analyze a script. Right. So it's a really good idea to read a, a, a screenwriting book about TV and film, depending on what you're interested in. Anyway, so in TV you have you have definitely you ge generally have three two or three stories going on, so a cue might have to cross over between two different storylines. So it's going to change nature. So you you need to learn how to go from one theme to another and make it work. I mean, it's interesting that you brought up reading scripts. Um, as a composer, it's not something that people would think a composer would have to do um, to learn. You know how, like the kind of the formula of a movie or a mm -hmm. television show or something like that. Is that something? I mean, do you read the script for every show that you work on? Do you end up asking for the scripts of each? Well, actually, no. I actually try. And, I actually don't read the scripts purposely. Okay. Why? Um, well, because the composer is the last person in the room that can push a, a film or a TV show one way or the other. Mm -hmm. The directors have seen it thousands of times. The editors have seen it thousands of times. The producers have seen it thousands of times. The only people that look at it new are the sound effects people and the composer. So I want to look at a film. I want to see what the film you know, ended up as. Because it doesn't always end up sure. the way they intended it to. And sometimes they don't know what their own film is. It's, they kind of know, but it's, <laughs> you really, you're not, it's, not a, it's not a fresh experience. You can't be the audience. So. I feel like I want to be the last audience before the real audience sees it. I see. Okay. You know, and then I can go, ah, oh, this... So know, when these characters aren't relating well, you know, so let's not... Let's save their theme till we need it. You know, don't, like, don't spend all your money, basically, on this scene. Let's wait till they're together, and, and they'll have a big swell. You know, things like that. I you see. sort of... You're just balancing, balancing out the movie. So when you're picking projects, do you still not read the scripts either, or? Well, sometimes I have to read the scripts. Yeah. Yeah. To sometimes I can't help. Doing, I mean, yeah. it's part of the job. People <laughs> yeah. want people want you to submit. They send you a script. Mm -hmm. You know. They're not. <laughs> and just like when I first see something, I don't want to see temp music either. Yeah. Oh yeah. But that's for sure. that's that I understand. Do you have to deal with that a lot as a composer? Unfortunately. You pretty much have to deal with it because if you haven't been hired yet, you don't want to be too demanding. <laughs> like, right. You know. Right. Yeah, you, know, you can request request it, but you generally you're going to get it with music on it. Does it ever impair your ability as a composer to be creative? Um, do you ever have notes that are like, I just want it to sound like this? Like, you oh, you get that all the time. You do? Okay. Yeah, sure. So you're living under that constraint constantly as yeah. a composer. I just like to see the film. I like to see a film without the music. I like to get my conception of the film together before I've seen any music. Uh... <clears throat> and then I'll see the temp music and go, oh, okay. I didn't think of that. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that's you it's. Keep a, that in mind. I'll keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, the, it's a, the temp music is something that's been through a series of hoops. There's a reason that it's there, is because it hasn't been knocked out. 
and you that's information because you want you need to put your score through a series of hoops as well you know and I'm actually pretty good I I don't want to brag but I'm pretty good at psyching my way through people through all films. of that yeah I don't get a lot of cues kicked back at me that's good I mean towards you know especially when I've been working with someone like we've gone through three showrunners now in Dexter and you know the end of the fourth season I never got any cues kicked back I knew what he liked I knew how to do it and then if I have a couple two three four shows I know what all the players are and what they don't like and I'll have a list of okay this person doesn't want this this person doesn't like this <laughs> so you kind of have to keep track a little bit of yeah a little bit sure, sure of you kind have of to. And, then you, and then lastly you have to make it work for yourself I mean most important you have to do what's right for you but sometimes you have to figure out a different way you to do to it. You have to please the people that are making the decisions, basically. Yeah. That's, that's interesting, because a lot of people, I think a lot of people, <coughs> what frustrates a lot of fans, at least, that you read, and this is, happens to music, too, and, you know, when, when you hear um, composers say, a, you know, they compose something, and it sounds very dramatically the same as something that they had composed two years ago, or it sounds very similar to you know, a Thomas Newman score or something like that. And, right. you're, and people just don't understand that they may have had that temp music sound like it, and, you know, they're like, oh, you, I saw Braveheart, and I just want you to compose something, like, when the gets his head chopped off. Like, it's got to be that theme, you mm -hmm. know, and then you hear it again. Um, but it's, I think that what you bring up is really cool, is that, like, you are under, people don't understand that composers are under very tight constraints, and mm -hmm. I think that... Um, as a composer, do you find that kind of thrilling that you have to kind of be creative under this, these, you know, kind of very tight schedules and demands from various people? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if thrilling is the right word. Stress, is it, it's stressful, obviously. It can be. Course, I've been doing it, you know, for long enough that I've learned stress doesn't help at all. <laughs> you know, I kind of know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it, whatever the deadline is, I know I'm going to make it. It was when I started, I'm like, Am I really? Am I going to make it? Gonna I'm not it? sure if I'm going to make it. <laughs> you know? How am I going to make it? You so know? what's a what's a typical deadline for a TV? Something made for TV? Like once you see something, like how long do you have to compose the music for it or make the music? Well, um, you know, with Dexter, I have I have an average of nine days per episode. Sometimes it's a week, two weeks. I try to get them to space it out, but that doesn't always work out like that. Okay. Um, with network TV, it can be as, you know, you can go three weeks of a week and a week, and then you might have a week off, no, two weeks for one episode. So the average is, you know, between eight, nine days, but it's usually in week blocks. You know, like three or four weeks of delivering a score is, is pretty tough. And I've had, I've gone where I've done two shows at the same time, where I've done Dexter and then Body of Proof, which is an ABC show where I've had three or four weeks where I've had to just, like... Just nonstop. Yeah. <laughs> like all that day, is tough. every day. TV's yeah. like, I mean, it's just the quick turnaround of TV. They're making a little mini movie every week and you got to produce it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds stressful. It does. The only thing that, the, the only thing in your favor with TV is once the show's been running for a while, you start to have a library of music. Yeah. You know, that you can pull from. Um, well, let's, let's actually play a cue real quick and mm -hmm. it's the blood theme, okay. which... Changes every season. Seems mm -hmm. like a little bit. It's kind of the same theme, but you, sure. have, you add different elements to it. And I'm going to play season five. Mm -hmm. And I actually, this kind of leads me up to, to the, next, um, the next instrument that, I, that you de are going to demonstrate for us in a second mm -hmm. and for the audience. But um, I have a feeling that one of the things you talked about in your interview for the, the Dexter score was uh, the saw. The saw? Mm -hmm. What was it? The saw instrument? Musical saw. Musical yeah. saw. Yeah. I think it's in this. Um, I'm not sure. You probably, you can probably correct me if I'm wrong. But um, I just want to play a quick, a quick cut of it and um, talk about it. Okay. So here we go.
so I actually was talking on the show um, with Daniel during the during the actual cue, and um, and I thought it was the saw instrument, but I was totally wrong. So w describe what that kind of whiny little well, the first the first instrument that that you the the melody is played by um, a viola played with artificial harmonics, so it's a, kind of a whistling sound. So when you say artificial harmonics, what does that mean? Well, they're t the, barely the touching. The composers will understand it. Yeah, you're actually you're you're fretting it and then you're touching it with your other little finger to make it like a harmonic, Got a higher it. harmonic. Got it. So it's so not an actually a note. It's like an airy harmonic of that note or yeah. something. Okay. Yeah, so we, a harmonic is dividing a string into its different uh, divisions. So they're touching it at what would be like if you have a fundamental, you can divide a string can also vibrate at at half the the size and three quarters, and they produce the overtone series, which is a major triad. I There's see. Music is based on physics, actually. Right. Um, anyways, uh, so that is that instrument. Okay. A and lot of people think do think it's a synthesizer, but it's you know, people are like, "What is that synthesized sound?" And it's actually not. It's just it's actually string players playing with a certain kind of. It's with a little glissando, with a little portamento. It's very, very cool. Actually, Chris, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to just um, play this cue real quick, and, um, and you can just keep the mics on. Yeah, we'll just talk over it. So this is the cue. You're, this is, that's the sound that... Yeah, that's it. Now, if you hear this kind of distorted sound, yeah. that took me about three or four days to make that sound, <laughs> believe it or not. Really? It's like playing synthesizers through filters. It's kind of like... Just I had something in my mind, and believe me, I was not happy either while I was doing it. I was like, can, I, can I swear on this show? <laughs> you can. I was like, I have a freaking score to write, and I have spent three days making one sound. <laughs> you know, like I'm getting nowhere. I was really up. You know, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm losing it here. But it turned out it's like a really cool sound that gives it like a. It, it gives it a very interesting, I, I kind of, it almost feels to me, it, it brings up an emotional response of like a web or, or like a stickiness or like an airy, something even ghostly even. And mm -hmm. it's like a little metallic too. And it's metallic, yeah. yeah. Oh, you mean like kind of like a scalpel metallic or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, well, I think, um, I think that kind of leads us to, to the next thing, which is you brought a, a, a kind of a little something I did. for us. I did. Time, time to begin the circus. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is exciting. This where's is, where's this the is dancing first, dogs? This is the first for film tracks. It's the sure. first thing for film track. I don't even think, actually, the audience, I don't think this has ever been done on a podcast, mm. uh, but this is awesome. So. I, actually, I actually just thought of this just um, recently, and I, I don't know why it, it never <laughs> came to me before. I was, I was sitting here bowing. This is just a xylophone, and I was bowing it on my lap like this, you know, like... I'm thinking, wow, it's really hard to get back and forth. It's, <laughs> Why not play it like this? It's amazing. Yeah. It's like a very eerie sound, right? You know, what you need to do is patent like a shoulder rest for mm. it. It's very light. <laughs> Some people are not too crazy, but I do use this sound uh, uh, a lot. You might, you know. So, t do, you, do you have recordings of each of these notes kind of in a library that you uh, use? No. Or? No, I haven't done that. Sometimes okay. I do that, but I, I, this is, I can play any note I want, so I'd rather do the real thing than it's have It's amazing. And, like, who would have thought to put a bow to a xylophone? Yeah, is that something a lot of composers do, or are you constantly kind of mixing and matching, like, instruments, well, you know, so to speak? You know, I'll do. Uh, I, People people have bowed a lot of things, and I, I you know I could look around here and I could just pick something up and probably make it make a sound. Mm -hmm. You know, this I don't hope I don't break anything, but anything metal you can bow. No, okay, <laughs> I could probably bow these guys up here. There we go. I, I mean, I'm definitely like always cognizant of sound everywhere I go, and I always like, oh, what kind of sound could I make with this? That's really interesting. So it's almost like kind of. You have the, this sound design, foley almost ideology of being able to make these sounds and then 
compile them in a way that gets gives you these kind of like very intense soundscapes or sometimes very open soundscapes and that's I think really interesting because I don't know if a lot of composers do that. Um, well, you know, I I, give you an ins for, I'll give you an instance of how I, how I work. It's like, okay, yeah, lots of people have xylophone samples, right? Right, okay. on the computer. But, yeah, or this, not, this isn't a xylophone, this is, this is a glockenspiel. But lots of people have glockenspiels and they're done with a standard mallet, you know? But, you know, you might say, well, what does it sound like if I play it like this? You know, hitting it with different things. Mm -hmm. Or you might want to play it with your fingers, you know. So it's kind of like... So this is, this is gamelan music, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm muting... I'm muting it. So it's just like it's a different sound. That's amazing. And then it gives, it gives the music a more unique sound and it doesn't sound like everybody else's music. Right, and I, I just think it's, it's funny that you spent three days on like a very specific element of one. <laughs> you, you get obsessed with something, though, and then it, it, it happens. I think all artists, yeah. like the, the, if you have something in your head, you, it's, it's, it's always the, the struggle to communicate it. But it's also just like pulling for music, too. It's like if you see, if you like know the song that needs to be there, but it's like you, if you, you can't, can't find, find it, it yeah. that, that right, perfect yeah. song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, so that's really awesome. I think that's amazing. I was actually... Um, when I saw your YouTube videos, I was like, oh my gosh, I should have asked to bring in, uh, you know, a toy or something. I was like, not the bone or anything like that, but yeah. like something, something. So it's like really great that you brought it. So thanks, oh, cool. thanks okay. for, for showing us that. Um, so I think for next, kind of the next jump we're going to make is um, going away from television into video games. I do want to tell you, want to make one little, okay. tell you one little interesting thing though about, and this is not quite related. But I mean, because I was in, in New York City, I was playing, you know, weird avant-garde stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how can I make crazy sounds with guitars? Because all the, you know, sax players were, they had different ways of making crazy sounds too. But interestingly enough, I got to hang out a little bit with Miles Davis. Wow. Because Miles Davis was just, even New York, you know, jazz musicians were just... Everybody knew Miles. Everybody knew, and he was always out in front of his house. And one thing he said to me that I thought was really interesting and always affected me, he said, he said that when he was a kid, since he was young, he used to listen to sounds like he'd hear a baby carriage go by and go, what notes was that playing? Mm -hmm. You know, so kind of the opposite, if you know uh -huh. what I mean. Well, I'll, go by, I'll go by a baby carriage and go, what notes can I make can that I make, play? Yeah. Right. You know? mm -hmm. right, what sounds can I make out of that? Yeah. That's so interesting. He, yeah. That's an interesting, it's, it's, to, it's like, it's kind of the same approach, but... I mean, it's going towards the same thing, but I think that, I mean, do you think that that's limiting, thinking about what notes that a certain device plays versus, like, what notes or what kind of sounds can I make from it? Because it seems like you can make an infinite amount of, you know, you have an infinite amount of possibilities when you, when you approach it kind of from, like, your frame of thinking. Well, he was hearing the notes of the, of the thing, and then he would try to translate that to playing the trumpet. He would filter that through his, his music that he played. Cool. But I'm actually like actually want to go get a baby carriage yeah. and, and like start bowling on the wheels. <laughs> you know? It was a totally different thing. Just leave you, the baby. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just leave the baby at home. Yeah, leave the baby. <laughs> because because I'm you know I'm working in recorded yeah. in recorded music. It's not live. Yeah. And for me, this is what I love working in a recording studio. I mean, I grew up on the Beatles and whatever. Just like, yeah. give me a recording studio, give me some instruments, bring in some players. That is fun for me. Yeah. On the video that we saw at the beginning, do you do you have like a, a home studio that you generally work out of? Yeah, I have a home studio. Nice. <clears throat> and that's where you do all your recording and everything. <clears throat> no, I mean, I, I for larger groups, I'll go into a recording studio. Yeah, recording yeah. studio. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, skipping on from Dexter, um, I'd like to definitely talk about video games, and I know that um, you've done a couple now of mm -hmm. Silent Hill video mm -hmm. game scores. And um, for the purpose of this show, I had picked Silent Hill Downpour to talk about. Um, is that was that your first video game score that you had ever done, or had you done? That, that is my first video game score. Yeah. So was that? How was that? That's not technically a hundred percent true. I had written uh, a main theme for a video game before that, but it was my first first kind of full, full length. Full length. Um, game that I had scored. Yeah. How was that? Was that any different from television or movies? Like, did you approach it differently? Um, was the music kind of first and then the video game? Or like, how did it work? 
in terms of um, just the workflow of it? Well, I, you know, I, I, it's a little different in that I did have to get the story to know what's going on. Uh, and it's, it's, a video game doesn't have to work like a film does. The people are playing and they're involved. And, you, you know, the, the cinematics, no one's going to get bored. And if they, don't, if they get bored, they're just going to go and play. Right. So it's not like... Um, but uh, the first thing I did worked on was the trailer. So that was really just like scoring anything. Mm -hmm. Did you play the game at all? Or no, like, no, I didn't play the game play the game. I, oh, I played the game before. Earlier versions of the game. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I did some. I did my research. Research. Research by playing. By playing. Recent hours <laughs> and hours. Video games. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that, I actually have a, a very cool spotlight interview with you about the score. Um, it's, I think it's really long, but um, and it was made by Konami. But I think we should show a little bit of it, sure. just to kind of give give the audience a little bit about what um, Silent Hill is about, and um, then we'll go into some more detailed clips. So let's check this out. Hi, I'm Dan Licht. I'm the composer for Silent Hill Downpour. Something's very wrong here. The Silent Hill world is dark and fraught. It's actually a very emotional game in a lot of ways. It generally, it seems like there's a backstory of loss. The main characters have you know, something that's at stake that's important to them. I try and make it expressive, but dark, emotional kind of world. It's not all about like psycho string stabs. There's some of that, obviously, but a lot of it's about mood. Silent Hill is always misty. A lot of the shots are at night, so the music is sort of kind of dark and misty too. Generally, in Silent Hill, the objective is to survive. <laughs> the genre, I guess, is called horror escape. You're always trying to get somewhere and solve a mystery, figure out what happened to this person. You're trying to find someone or save someone or help someone. But a lot of it is just to get from point A to point B without getting killed. I think what a lot of people like about it is that even if there's no monsters attacking you, it's that sort of the walking around this creepy deserted town is a kind of a cool feeling and that you are free to go in different buildings. You can't undo anything you've already done, but you can face up to it. What? Who's there? I do a lot of dark projects, and I definitely will go into that mood. And sometimes it'll take me maybe a, an hour or half hour to get out of that mood. So I might, see, when I'm working a lot, and I, if I see people, they're like, what's wrong with him? I'm just kind of still like, you know, in that world a little bit. With so I think, I think it's interesting um, talking when you're talking about the video game, because it seems like it's it's based on a central character kind of going through this world. Um, did you you said you know the story before you started composing? Um, but how did you approach, creatively approach this game? Um, since you had never really kind of scored a full game before, um, talk about the music a little bit and and how it kind of was was different. Well, I thought about it. Uh, I thought about it in the scoring. I created the score in the same way as I would for a movie except for that I didn't know the exact order. There was no precise timings for when things would happen, other than cinematics. So how does it work, like, if you're playing the game and you're going through a world, did you have to write specific cues for, like, moments in the game? Or Certain levels, I guess? Yeah, yeah like... Well, there's two, there's two different kinds of, uh, of scoring in, in a video game. There's gameplay. You have to provide music that happens during gameplay. <coughs> and that's... that's um, not going to have a specific uh, film sync to it. That's just going to be... Constantly going in the background? Constantly, it might be a two-minute piece. It might be a three-minute piece. On some games, it might be a 20-second piece. The different game developers like to work different ways. Some of them like give me 400 20-second loops that can all go from each other to each other. I'm like... <laughs> puzzle, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> um, but... Um, but uh, so you're going to have gameplay music that's kind of like, you know, building blocks of, of what's happening. Right. And then you're going to score cinematics. But they'll also frequently, they'll take music you've written and put, put it into the somewhere. cinematics. So. Did you, 
Did you use the same kind of approach for this score, like by combining different sounds and recording different sounds of like the scalpel and bone cutting? Like, did you do that? Yeah, for I this did one? sound design. Now, I don't always do acoustic sound design either. Sometimes it's just on a th on a synthesizer. On a synthesizer, yeah. sometimes it's just just the the amount of sound sounds that are available now is just staggering. Yeah. <laughs> but to you find said the right sound. I know I like I know certain patches are good for certain things. So mm -hmm. I'll go to this one. Okay, this has a good this. And then I'll go and I'll start tweaking it. But you said that you you collected or you kind of had a huge library of sounds that you have recorded, right? So do you try to I mean, do you use your library first? Oh, I have a, I have a, yes, I do have my own library of sound as well. Okay. Which I've recorded samples. So of. how long have you been doing I mean have you been doing that since the beginning? Oh yeah, since I started. You know, it's pretty and I amazing. still pull things out from my first few films. I'm like, oh, that was a cool sound. <laughs> I still have, and I still have um, synthesizers that I have one sound on that I like. <laughs> but you just gotta save it for that one. I sound. have never <laughs> been able to recreate that sound. I'm like, oh god, I gotta pull out this, this thing and plug it in. And, yeah. <laughs> and then I'm always like, God, I hope the, the memory doesn't die in this thing because I'll never have this sound again. I know. Again. Oh my gosh. So like, do you have a huge room full of instruments and all of these? You know, do you have like a big database computer of like everything of yeah, that you can data. access at any time? Yeah, this is the database. This <laughs> is right <just> up here. <laughs> I don't know if I can access it all the time or not. But yeah, that's the only database I have. So um, I'm going to play a quick clip, and it's actually from the score to this game, and it's a great clip. I, it's definitely one of my favorites of the score, and it's called um, Into Park Walk. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's very dynamic, and I think the audience will definitely get a taste of um, what the score is all about. So um, let me play this clip, and um, Chris, I'm going to play a uh, YouTube video over it. Let me just get it real quick. And... Um, Okay. All right. really really cool theme for a variety of reasons but what is that is it there's a guitar and sound in there is that mm -hmm. what what instrument is that you're talking about the like, high melody yes the that's high a melody. mandolin it's a mandolin it's a tremolo mandolin very cool and and I actually used I used that that instrument because that was the um, a featured instrument in the first Silent Hill the first game yeah okay so I decided to, to use that to really just sort of it's like, you know, having, taking a piece of furniture, someone's favorite furniture, and putting it in a room just to make the audience feel more comfortable in a sense. It's, it feels like, like, like also there's, there's this kind of, like, crash sound. Mm -hmm. Is that, was that synthesized, like, drum percussion, or was that, like, something that you recorded hitting? Oh, it was probably a bunch of things. I might have done some crashing on some on a gong or something and some synthesizers yeah so one thing i was reading about in just like reviews of of your music is that it's um it's always like people say it's eerie and it can mm -hmm. be very scary at times is mm -hmm. that something that you prefer like do you prefer kind of these dark 
stories and composing for them, or are you, are you just dying to score? Do a, a comedy romantic comedy. No <laughs> well, no, I just I don't this, I'm just laughing because this reminds me. It just like a long time, a long time, long ago when I was first starting out, I, I went over to visit my uh, my cousin who had two small kids, and she's like, "Can you play me some music? Please play me some music." <laughs> and and I'm like, "You really want to hear it?" And I was like, so I played her. Some music from Children of the Corn too. <laughs> and her little kids, came, her little daughter came out and said, "Mommy, can you please stop playing the scary music? I can't sleep." <laughs> I'm like, "Oh God!" <laughs> I felt really bad. <laughs> but that's not something you meant to. I mean, you didn't mean yeah. to scare her, right? You were just playing right. music. It's funny. <laughs> Anyways, uh, sorry. But your Children of the Corn scary. I, I I get it. That little kid knows what's up. Yeah, yeah. 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 She she hates scary movies, so like she At would probably scary. have been freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> They're supposed to scare. Yeah. But well, it's funny because my my wife is not into them at all. But you know, she watched some of it, and she was like, "Like, wow, I feel really manipulated." Well, yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, well, that's is that good or bad? It's like, yeah, I'm supposed to be manipulating you. That's what the music's supposed to do, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so is that? I mean, is that? I guess my question is: Is that kind of something you gravitate towards as a composer? Like, as a creative person, do you go? Do you say, "Oh, that's a, I got to get that. Go explore that game because you know it seems like a very interesting dark theme." Like, do you gravitate towards? kind of the scarier. Oh, yeah, yeah. So to answer your question, um, I've done some broad comedy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I did a show called Oliver Bean. It's just like stupid broad comedy. <laughs> um, and I like doing that. You know, it's kind of like you're in a better mood <laughs> in certain ways. You kind of like, you know, sit around and crack yourself up. Mm -hmm. yep. But um, it's a lot of work. Uh, I, you know, you know, there's there's always a cliche that comedy is the hardest to do, right. and it's true. And it, and the reason it's so hard is because it's so subjective as to what's funny or not funny. And I, and I like doing comedy, but I know that it's much harder to score comedy than it is anything else, because yeah. you can go any way with comedy, and it's totally up to this person can think this, this person can think that, and it's it's just uh, it takes it's like another dimension of of creative choice there that you have to make. When you're scoring a film versus a video game, um, at at the end, like, is the body of work big, generally bigger with the video game or the film? Which which kind of ends up with more music? Like, it totally depends on the project. The project, uh, you know, I've worked on films. It depends on the director too. Mm -hmm. I worked on films where you know I sat down and we're starting to spot the film and we're through the first five minutes, first ten minutes, and then and I'm like. Um, and they're, okay, I want a cue to start here. And then it starts the next cue. I'm like, hold on. Is, it, are we gonna, is the music going to stop <laughs> at any point? <laughs> <laughs> and I just need two and a half solid hours. You know? <laughs> I end up pissing him off. And I'm like, okay, I get it. Let's just go. <laughs> and so there's so much music in there. And then after I'd scored the whole thing, they took the then music and they filled in the gaps with music I'd written. <laughs> Really? Even with the little, little spaces mm -hmm. where there was no music got filled in with music. I'm not going to say what the project is. But for me, it was terrible. It, for me, it ruined my score. Yeah. I, mean, I was like this in the breaks. theaters, people watching it going, oh my God, these people think I made these choices mm -hmm. when I didn't. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I could see how frustrating that could be. I mean, do you listen to a lot of your music, like after you score, a, score something, do you listen to the entire album by itself? Like how often do you listen to your music? I only listen to my music when I have to. I don't like to yeah. sit around and listen to it. So you know, you I have to put together a real. I have to put together a CD. I'll listen to it. Sometimes I'll I'll listen to something I've done years and years ago and go because I'm listening to it like I've never heard it before and it's going mm -hmm. oh. And sometimes that? I've even had stuff tempt in and, and where I've gone oh yeah that's pretty cool man. I wish I could write like that. Yeah. Wait a second, I <laughs> did like, write did like that. that. <laughs> yeah, I really seriously. <laughs> Oh, I did write like that. <laughs> um, so you have actually been recognized now uh, with the BMI Film and TV Awards, most recently as Composer of the Year, and at the third annual Horror Awards in Moscow, Russia. So, so describe what what that is. Did you go to Mo to, to Moscow? Oh, for I did. That? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, um, what were they like in terms of horror awards? Were they just giving you an award for your body of? Or like movies that you had scored. Or? Well, I guess the, specifically it was the audience choice. Cool. You know, composer of the year, horror composer. You know, for the horror, international, the Moscow International Horror Film Festival. Were you up against other composers for? Words? I think so. 
That's pretty cool. Or it might be just I was the only one that yeah. was going to go. <laughs> just yeah. b book the flight. Okay. Yeah. You, you yeah. Hear it. <laughs> I mean, they flew me there, but it was yeah. in Moscow in, in January. Oh, so. my gosh. <laughs> so did you take your, like, big parka and... <laughs> oh, yeah. Actually, I actually ended up buying a whole wardrobe for it. <laughs> oh, <bet. laughs> But and I was, but it was kind of cool actually. If, I think if you're going to go to Russia, you should go in the winter. Yeah, no, so it feels I mean, like Russia. Yeah, for sure. You know? I agree. When I, when you travel like that, did, like, did you do you try to like take in some local music or like listen to like the sounds or get inspired by the city at all or anything like that? Um, you didn't. I don't know that I saw any music. There's there's basically. No, I did see what one jazz group that was pretty cool in a jazz club nice. in Moscow. That was pretty nice, um, but I was kind of busy, you know. They yeah. had they had a whole agenda for us, yeah. you know. And Do you still travel a lot and and listen to sounds from all oh, over absolutely. the world? And I do. Cool. I mean, I, you know, when I travel, I, I I like to, I'll go to the music stores. I mean, I'm, like I went to Turkey, I traveled in Turkey, and I'll go down the main thing and I'll go to the music shops and like. I, I went to this one place and I'll pick up an instrument and I'll start playing it. And the guy, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Don't touch. And he'll pick it up. And, go, oh. and then you start bowing it and they're like, where did you get this bow? And then I'll try it. And then I end up like, I'm there for like an hour and I'm getting a music lesson. Yeah. <laughs> you know? That's awesome. Well, so, so, um, I, we're, we're actually running short on time, so I want to kind of quickly jump to something new that you've been working on. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's a film documentary called Dumbstruck, mm -hmm. which I read in your notes. Um, so is that a recent project that's it's going to... It's fairly recent. It's uh, maybe a year Is it year out ago. on, like, Netflix? or? I think it might be. I'm not sure. It was out in theaters, and I think, I'm sure it's on Netflix right now, yeah. So um, for the audience that um, that's watching, Dumbstruck, I was reading, is a, um, is a documentary. And correct me if I'm wrong. It's of a ventriloquist mm -hmm. kind of meeting. So it's a bunch yeah. of ventriloquists that come together mm -hmm. and talk about their ventriloquist craft. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it follows five ventriloquists, and they're, it's a pretty great documentary. It actually. looks really interesting. I actually have a quick clip of the movie trailer that I want to show you guys. We'll, we'll maybe play 45 seconds or so, but you can get an idea of, um, of what this is about. And, um, and you scored the, the whole documentary, yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this will give you a kind of different idea as to um, something else that, that Daniel has done. Which I is have no cool. idea what's in the trailer, but hopefully it'll be my music. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Well, you can actually answer that then. <laughs> Hold on. Check, Here check, check, check. Hey, check. 30 minutes, this place is going to be crazy with ventriloquists. All right. Hey, welcome everybody. 31st. Ben Haven Convention. What do you think of that? A lot of times the vents are really isolated. Like, hey, I'm the only vent in my town, and they don't have anybody to talk to. So here, they get to talk to people. Those cards to the ride. It's going to be great. Shut up. Let's play cards. I think I'm going all in. Actually, quite a few ventriloquists who started out initially were quite shy and are still shy, and that's not an uncommon trait among ventriloquists. I came to my first convention, and I, I just fell in love with the people. Everyone's so friendly, and everybody is like me. Talk to themselves and play with dolls for a living. <laughs> hey, Charlie. I'm running late to the show, but I do need you to help fix my dummy that his ankle's fallen off, and I need little tiny nails. I work full-time as a ventriloquist. I did 482 shows last year. I do the school assemblies throughout the school year, and on the weekends, I do different shows with birth and... I actually got my start in the... So, you can kind of get an idea for the, um, the movie. Mm -hmm. How long, about how long... It's not going to be as ominous of a oh, score. Not no. as ominous. No. <laughs> so, this is kind of a different flavor. No dead bodies, just wooden bodies. <laughs> so, how did you get approached for this... Did you did you get approached to do the music? Uh, yes, uh, someone recommended me, um, a friend of mine. Very cool. And uh, um, and you said that it was just recently released. So is this newer than Silent Hill? Um, no, Silent Hill's more recent. This was about a year ago it was released. I okay. Think. okay. Yeah. But and, it, and it's just probably coming out on Netflix and DVD. Question for the fans: Is this something we can buy as a album? There's a CD out. Yeah. There's a CD, CD on, out. Okay. Uh, hmm. I'm not sure. Is it on maybe Amazon or, or iTunes? You can maybe find iTunes. it on Amazon. You Amazon? can find it on Amazon, I'm okay. sure. There's also a, there's a hard CD out. I just don't remember who released it. Okay. Um, 
So I think, I mean, I, I wanted to kind of like talk about that because I was just thinking about it as we were talking about like, you know, your scores and how people think that they're eerie and then people mm -hmm. thought your music was scary. But then I was like, oh, wait, he's done a documentary mm -hmm. of this like ventriloquist <laughs> yeah. that seems to be kind of a lighthearted, yeah, a goofy, goofy, you know, kind of music um, yeah. and story. So, um, so cool. So where, what's happening next? So what, what exactly is on your plate that... That's, that's going on? Well, right now I am in the fits of uh, organizing a live concert. A live concert? Of the music from Dexter. Here in L.A.? Here in L.A. Are you going to bring the bone saw? Or? Uh, possibly. <laughs> I'm not sure what the laws are about that. <laughs> She's going to start you know? sawing off people in the orchestra? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Orchestra pit? <laughs> I, I, I may, the, I'm sure the bone saw will probably be involved. So this is amazing. So you're having a live show, which mm -hmm. I think is, um, it's, it's rare to have a composer do a live show, right? I mean, you, I see him once in a while on, on, on the internet. Yeah. And I'm always like, oh, I can't believe I missed it. You know, it's like, right. oh. So are you having it, where, which venue are you it's having? It's at, uh, at the Largo at the Coronet Theater in Los Angeles on La Cienega, and it's uh, June 10th. Nice. And June it's 10th. selling out fast. So. so everybody listening in the audience, get your tickets. If you don't live in L.A., fly out to L.A. and come check out the show. And um, it's very, very cool that you mentioned a live show. We'll definitely have to check it out. And I'm, I am uh, planning, you know, this is the first of it, and I do. Want, we are planning on taking it on the road. So Cool. Really? So, so like it a might road? be coming to a city you, near you. You just want to be a rock star, basically. Is that it? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. So Minus the groupies, because yeah. I am married. But other than that. <laughs> so you're literally going to take a bus and drive around, or fly around, and... Oh, I don't know if it's going to be Do, that. like, the whole road trip experience <laughs> on the road? <laughs> Well, I don't think we're going to go. I don't think we're going to go city to city. Major, <laughs> major cities. That's, that's Europe, right. Uh, joking aside, it actually is pretty cool. So, like, what, um, what do you, what's on the plate for for the last show? Are you going to do Dexter and uh, kind of your major movies, or? Yeah, yeah. Just I'm going to do Dexter um, and some of the stuff. Not a lot from the movies, but I might do a theory. I, Dexter. There's so much music I've written for Dexter that it's it's hard for me to knock the kind of the Dexter cues off and then put something else on when people are coming to see Dexter. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be mostly Dexter. I'm going to do a little bit. I'm going to do the song from Silent Hill. Elizabeth, uh, Mary Elizabeth McLynn is going to be the singing and she's, pe Silent Hill fans know who she is. She's like the voice of Silent Hill. So is that, is this something you're practicing now? Like are you rehearsing this now? I'm, I'm writing the arrangements right you're now. You're writing the arrangements. That's <laughs> yeah. really cool. That's really yeah. cool. So, so I, I have to condense and, you know, make... Do you know how many, like, how big of an orchestra you're going to have with you? It's going to be, um, it's a small stage. So it's yeah. going to be, like, 10 or 11 mm -hmm. players and some people walking on and going off. Mm -hmm. Sounds very cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And, um, and I, I'm going to be bowing some things. Mm -hmm. Do you know, it, so you're going to be, con are you going to be, you're going to be conducting and also, um, you're going to be conducting but also performing at the same time? Introduce the show. Sorry. Rumor has it that Michael C. Hall is going to be there. Too. Oh, yes. Is Michael C. Hall is going to introduce the show. <laughs> Michael C. Hall is going to be there? I didn't know. I, didn't know. Did just, yeah. I, Did, I just, just heard a whisper. I hope we didn't just ruin a surprise. Uh, <laughs> is he yeah. bad? That's amazing. Yeah, he's going to introduce the show, yeah. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. So it's definitely Dexter-based, it seems like. Yeah. And... Um, and I know, like, I somebody actually in chat was like, why are why have you only seen season one of that? I mean, what, they're on season five now? Are they doing another, are they on their sixth season? Uh, seventh. I starting the seventh now. Seventh. So yeah. I'm, like, so behind. I need to see six seasons all in a row now. I did That's that with Lost. Like, I saw all Lost seasons. It took me, like, two months to, like, go well, through everything because it was, like, 14 I watched all of Lost except for the last episode. You didn't watch the last episode? <laughs> no. I'm never going to see it. In, in no, I don't think so. I think I watched half of it. I'm like... Yeah. <laughs> so those of you that are watching, that's, that's fine. <laughs> check us out on Trig on on Twitter, Facebook, and um, what Daniel talked about in terms of the live show. We'll put that on our website as well, so you can click on a link and buy your tickets if you live locally. Daniel, we're actually are running out of time or ran out of time, so thank you so much for being on the show and demonstrating your genius with your soundscapes <laughs> and very cool instrument that you brought. Um, yeah. You'll have to be on our show again. Um, so okay. thank you. You're welcome. And so thank everybody, um, everybody still watching, check us out, Twitter, Facebook. Dan Linked actually has a Twitter uh, handle, so follow him as well. And again, all of this stuff will be on our website. Go on iTunes, check us out, rate us, like our show, 
And yeah, if you are a composer and a someone who likes the show and wants to talk about a specific cue or anything, go to our website and do go to the contact page on Film Tracks. There's a little widget on the side that you can contact Jesse or I. So contact us. We'd love to hear from you and talk about your stuff. Thanks again for coming. Thank you. You're Thank you guys. See you next week. <laughs>